This is a long video just to tell you that I have a new camera. <laughs> On that note... Kinfinity is a company out of China that makes cinema cameras that are modular in style. And it was first brought to my attention when Philip Bloom posted this picture on Instagram back in... I didn't look up when he posted it. 2000. I forgot to look it up after I wrote the script. I had never heard of Kinfinity before this moment, but after I saw this photo, I was really, really interested in where it came from and what could it do. Unfortunately, it was out of my price range at the time and I wasn't really looking for a new camera, but I did keep an eye on it. Fast forward a few years and I was ready for an upgrade. I had been using my Sony a7S II for about three years now uh, and I had been doing a professional uh, video production business and this was my main workhorse camera. But I had been seeing myself wanting to upgrade for a while now. I wanted to get into a different style of camera. Luckily, in 2020, we had a bunch of cameras come out this year. I mean, we're talking about the Sony ZV-1 <laughs> for vlogging. We got the uh, Blackmagic 12K Ursa. We have the a7C that just came out, the Canon R5 and R6. We're not gonna talk about those. Um, there was even the 1DX Mark III. Oh, and the Red Komodo just came out. Anyway, point is, a whole lot of cameras came out this year, so it was the perfect time for me to upgrade. If I was gonna upgrade my camera system in any year, this was year to do it. But here's the thing. Out of all the cameras, including the Sony A7S III, which is a direct upgrade from my personal camera, even though that came out this year, I decided to go with the Mavo 6K Super 35. And here's why. But first, a little bit of history. Um, before we continue, I should let you know that this is not a review of the camera. This is not a first impressions. This is not really about the camera at all. So if that's what you care about, if you just care about specs or whatever, then uh, skip to this time code somewhere. I'm putting it on the screen. Um, this is a personal story. There's some history here. This this is the reasons why I buy a camera and uh, So yeah, if you're not into that, then just s Skip ahead. Okay, so the first camera that I bought when I was 17 years old was this Samsung Camera, I don't even know they didn't have names for this Easy Q if you don't know, these cameras shoot on tape. And I bought this after working at Pizza Hut, a part-time job answering phones for a few summers. And then I bought this and I used it to document me and my friends, things happening around that time. Digital cameras did not exist. Sorry, digital video cameras at the time did not exist. This is what it was. Got my start on tape. Very important to know. Sticking along those lines, in 2008 is the next time that I bought a camera. I was in Iraq at the time and I was finally looking to get into the digital age, so I got this Canon Vixia HFS 10 camcorder. Uh, I was not a filmmaker at this time. I was just a person that liked documenting my life. I didn't care about film. I was in the military, I was in Iraq, and I just wanted something that could I could bring with me to Germany and to Venice and the places I was traveling uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, and that's basically it. And this is the first digital camera I owned. I did own a Canon Rebel something before this, but I used it for photography. So it was the first DSLR I owned. I did not know that the Canon 5D would be released around this time. And if you don't know, the Canon 5D, uh, specifically the Mark II, I think was the camera that started the digital DSLR video revolution. It changed independent filmmaking for a while now and I didn't know that had come out. All I knew is I needed a camera and I got something that had good optical zoom. It had it gave me some manual fo a manual focus thing. This is really this is really all I needed. I wrote like nine pages of a script and I am not following it to a single letter and I have no idea what I'm saying. I didn't buy a camera for another eight years. I moved to Austin in 2010, 
shortly after my time in the military was up and I just continued to learn about acting and filmmaking and I went to school and I did workshops and in the meantime if I had anything to make we used the cameras that uh, my friends had which was like this Canon 60D and the 70D and we used Canon 5D Mark II and we used a few of those things and the next time I got around to buying a camera it was in 2016 when I started vlogging. And that was the Sony A6000 that I bought off of Craigslist for about 500 bucks. And uh, this was what I used for vlogging to start this YouTube channel in about 2016. This is what finally got me into DSLR filming or mirrorless, if you will. And then, as I mentioned earlier, I got the Sony A7S II and I started working professionally with this camera for the past pretty much three years. So why did I tell you all this? Well, because I am very picky when it comes to cameras. The reason there was an eight year gap between me buying cameras was because even though the DSLR revolution had started coming and it had given filmmakers interchangeable lenses, sharp footage, cinema style dynamic range, and a whole plethora of things at a low budget, allowing people to make amazing products that they weren't able to do before, even though it gave us all of these things, I was not a fan of the DSLR revolution. I didn't like the form factor and I couldn't help but shake the feeling that these cameras were not made for me. These cameras were catered to photographers first and then they realized that they need to tack on some video things for other people. Now, Sony was experimenting with their mirrorless cameras and they seemed to be putting a lot of video functions first, which is why I went with the a7S II and the A6000 when I needed some good low budget video cameras. And I think they were really trying to innovate. Unfortunately, no one was innovating for video cameras anymore. Uh, camcorders, things that were made specifically for video makers, that had stopped and grew stagnant as DSLR started going on the rise and I just wasn't a fan of that. Now as I grew as a filmmaker I was getting hired more and more as a professional cinematographer and so that required more and more professional workflow and I found that using the Sony a7S II while it was great when I first started working I was finding trouble pushing the camera to the professional needs that I needed it to happen so I knew it was the time for an upgrade. It was time for me to look at cinema cameras. The only place where innovation was happening when camcorders got left in the dust and DSLRs were happening. Cinema cameras were the only place that was trying to do things for video specifically. Unfortunately, they weren't all that cheap. A lot of them were pretty expensive. Now, there are some relatively cheap cinema cameras out there, but we have to consider that I needed something that I could upgrade to. It needed to give me a similar quality, if not better, and I needed to be able to grow with it. It needed to grow with me. I needed to be able to push it and I needed to be able to do things with it that even I didn't know were possible so that I can have a proper upgrade. Here's what I wanted. I needed something that was an E-mount because I had already invested in Sony lenses and in E-mount lenses. And so I wasn't willing to buy a camera and get a whole new lens set because I just didn't have the money for that. I also needed a full HD mic cord. Um, I needed uh, 4K at high frame rates. Doesn't matter as long as it's over 30 FPS. And then I needed a uh, log. That's it. I didn't care about dual card space. I didn't care about raw. I didn't care about any of those things. Those are the things that I knew needed to be there. And I wanted to stay within a budget of five to $7,000. Now, originally my budget had actually been a lot cheaper, but I had just gotten a job and I was saving up. But I knew even after I was done saving, I wasn't gonna be able to afford any more than that. So that was the price range that I knew I was gonna have to stick close to. So you might be wondering why I didn't just go with the A7S III. Now let's talk about that. Now when the Sony A7S III was first announced after five years of waiting, just like everyone else, I was getting pretty excited. They hadn't revealed the camera yet and I was just kind of hoping. There was something that I was hoping for. See, here's the thing. The Sony A7S II was the one camera that seemed to put video first. 
this camera wanted to be a video camera. It wanted to be a cinema camera. And I wanted it to be a cinema camera. I was looking at the Sony line of cinema cameras, the FS5, the FS7, the FX9, and these things were hella expensive. They were out of my price range, and I'm comparing them to other cinema cameras like the Z Cam uh, and the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Cam, and I'm like, where is Sony's middle budget in between their mirrorless cameras and their cinema cameras, where's their middle budget cinema camera? And that's what I wanted the A7S III to be. I hoped, beyond all hope, that when this camera came out, that it would ditch the old form factor, they would give us a small little box of a camera, and they would price it out to, I don't care what the price was, if it was 5K or what, I want 6K it could be. This was the perfect camera that it wants to be everything that a cinema camera is. And this could be their low budget or mid budget offering of cinema camera and I wanted that. And that's not what it was. <laughs> yes, it can do 4K at 120 frames per second and it has all intro recording. And I tell you what, it has a full HDMI port and I was this close to saying, that's it, I want that camera. Give me that camera, take my money. Full HDMI port, you had me. Except for one thing, is that it was still a form fact, it still looked like this. Not exactly like this, obviously, but it still was this form factor photo. This is not a video camera to me. This is not what I wanted. It had a lot of good things going for it. The A7S III is a great camera, but I just couldn't do it. I needed something that gave, put me into a professional space. This wasn't it. This is something that's still made for videographers. And to me, videographer is a dirty word. I don't like using it anymore. That's coming in another video. We're gonna talk about that later. This was not made for me. I didn't want to buy another mirrorless or DSLR camera that was just going to be outdated next year when they release another version. And yeah, the Sony A7S is 4 is probably not going to come out for another, uh, you know, five years or anything. But the R5 might come out or another new line of the A7C came out. It's a full frame, smaller, compact. I mean, it's already outdated if you start looking at what they're doing and they're putting full frame into smaller sizes. These cameras, as soon as you spend this much money, there's another one that's gonna come out that's gonna wanna pull you from getting that. And I didn't want that. I wanted something that I invest in and I have like several years with it and I don't have to worry about what I'm losing or missing out on. I needed something that already had those things that I was gonna grow into. Now, don't get me wrong, this is, the A7S III is a good camera. I like it. I think it's perfect for a lot of people. Honestly, if I didn't have any other options, uh, then this probably would have been the camera that I would have upgraded to, but if I wasn't so prideful about what I wanted in some cameras, then I would be getting it. It's just not made for me. Hey guys. I'm recording this from the floor of my home studio because essentially I give up. A few days ago I was on a music video set and the FX6 from Sony was announced. A cinema camera of which exactly I was looking for. Uh, it is the perfect little cinema camera entry level between the Sony line of mirrorless cameras and their pr more professional, bigger budget cinema cameras. And well, yeah. Uh, I was in the middle of making this video as well and it was just uh, a real shocker. Should have seen it coming, right? So I guess you're probably wondering what do I think of the FX6? And well, I don't really want to go into like a whole bunch of thoughts like I did on the other cameras. Essentially everything I say about the a7S III 
uh, everything I say about the Komodo and other things. And essentially I've come to the same conclusion. If this camera had come out sooner, the FX6, I might have bought it. Uh, I might have gotten it. This might have been my main camera. It would have been great, but it didn't. Uh, essentially, it's still not out. I know that there's other things about it that I'm not a big fan about as much as it is a really good camera. Uh, and so do I regret my decision? No. The Mavo is a really good camera and I've used it on two different shoots this week and I don't regret a thing. So yeah, this is a small section just to tell you that I understand. I have seen the camera. I've watched all the review videos. I have seen the specs. Um, you don't have to tell me. It is out. I get it. This is the camera that I was talking about that I was wanting from Sony. Um, and it is essentially exactly what I was hoping for when the A7S III came out, the one that I was hoping that we could get. Um, at the same time, when I compare it to what I did buy, uh, I don't regret a thing. Hope that solves that, and let's move on. So now let's talk about the Mavo. If you're a person that cares about specs, let's talk about specs. Mavo can shoot raw, DNG cinema at like a 3151 and 71 compression rate. So you get raw internally already. And then you got ProRes 444, XQ, ProRes 444, 422, 422, Proxy and LT, all internal. You got 6K and 4K and 2K. And not only that, you get options for 5K and 3K. And you got resolutions like two four to one ratios and 16 by nine and four by three and then you got open gate at three to six k open gate who's doing that other than ari or red no one <laughs> you got a super 35 sensor which while it's not full frame and everyone cares about full frame super 35 is still a standard cinema sensor so who cares it's a, something that i'm downgrading i guess if i'm going from a full frame camera to super 35 but i can deal with that because i get 4k up to 74 frames per second i think uh, i can do i think i can do 6k up to 74 i need to check that <laughs> i can do 2k up to 190 something frames per second yes i have to crop the sensor kind of sucks that i can't use the full sensor at those higher frame rates, but the options there, and that's amazing. You get all this internal and in a body that's only $5,000. And this is where I mentioned that the last time you heard of Confinity, if you have heard of them, it may have been way before 2020, way before this pandemic started. And I have to tell you something, they dropped their prices in February of 2020, and it went from being an $8,000 camera to a $5,000 camera. And I don't know why they dropped their prices, but I think that's why they're worth talking about right now is because they are now relatively affordable cameras. If you want the Terra 4K camera, which is also still a really good low budget cinema camera, you're getting it for like close to three to $4,000. Not to mention they just added ProRes 4 for 4 this year in a firmware update. You may have looked at this camera a long time ago and thought, not worth it, too much money for what it is, but these guys are actually doing something and they've added things that people want and they've made it relatively affordable. This is a company that clearly wants to make cameras for video people and they care about video people because they're giving me exactly what I want at a price that I can afford. And I'm told that another RAW format's coming in a later firmware update. That's great. I don't use RAW right now, but that's awesome. So if you've been sleeping on the Confinity, I think you should give it another look. Now the catch for this $5,000 price point is that you don't get anything else with it. That's just for the body. So there's a few things that you're gonna need if you're gonna make this a actual camera. First off, you need a monitor. You can get one of theirs, but I already had some monitors lying around, plug it into HDMI, good to go. The other thing is you need SSDs. This camera doesn't use CFAS, doesn't use SD cards. It uses the 2.5 inch SSD cards. Now the good news is that they accept third party SSDs. You don't have to use their proprietary SSD, which I think costs $800 for the 
a 500 gigabyte one. I was able to get a 500 gig and a one terabyte SSD for under or about $200. Even if you get third-party SSDs, you have to try them out. You have to know that they're fast. There's very few of them that might, they'll work with it, but my one terabyte SSD keeps cutting off on me. Even when I record in ProRes L, uh, 422LT, it's not handling the higher codecs. It'll cut off after a few seconds. Maybe it'll last uh, if I'm doing very light stuff like 422, if I'm not recording for 30 minutes at a time, that's fine it'll work. The other SSD, the Samsung Evo, does work. And this is a, um, I'm sorry, the Evo and the Samsung Pro. These are SSDs that uh, do work and they're relatively cheap compared to the other ones. I don't know if they'll shoot raw, because I haven't tried raw. Something to note about the Samsung SSDs is that they have these little metal mounts on it that can snag on the SSD door and it's good to tape them up or to uh, use a credit card or something plastic to make sure that it slides in and out just fine without snagging on the door or destroying anything. But other than that small little thing, it works just fine. Uh, the other thing to worry about is power, but you got plenty of options there because uh, the camera doesn't just accept batteries. You need to get something external for it to work. So you got a side grip that comes with batteries. I chose not to go that route. I went with this V-mount back that I can use my V-mount batteries that I already had. And of course it accepts third-party V-mounts, which is great. Uh, they also have a uh, upgradable version of the V-mount Kineback, which they call the Kineback W that gets you two XLR ports. It gets you SDI, it gets you wireless transmission cards. It gets you, um, time code jamming and other syncing capabilities. Overall, I think I'm gonna to upgrade to that in the future, but for now, this light one, which just gets me power, is fine for me and it works for now and it keeps me under my budget. And of course, if you want a proper cinema camera, you need a kit or a cage or mounting points or rails or something. And fortunately, Kinefinity makes a Kini kit for specifically for the Mavo and the Terra. And it comes with a shoulder pad and some rails and a nice top handle, all for a pretty affordable price. And it fits perfectly with your camera. And if you want, if you like this, if you're a person unlike me who likes shoulder rig things, you can also get the shoulder extension arm and handle. And I'm just not a fan of those, but you can get those. And you know, that's the thing about DSLRs too. If you really, really, really want to be a professional cinematographer and you're using a DSLR, you most likely have a cage and you're most likely gonna build it out and put these rails on it and have to maybe use a V-mount battery and all these different things. And it doesn't make sense for this form factor. It just, at the end of the day, this form factor doesn't do anything. Now the final catch is that you need to choose a lens mount. And this is the best part. Out of all the cinema cameras that I looked at within this price range of what I wanted to get, I was going to get an E-mount. One of the reasons I went with Kin Infinity is they have an E-mount. But yes, there's adapters out there. Yes, there's speed boosters. I really don't want to use those things. I really don't, I don't want to use an adapter. I don't want to have to do that to get a camera to work the way I want. Sometimes you lose light. Sometimes there's a crop factor. There's actually a, a, a very few amount of E-mount adapters or, or, or uh, for other cameras actually, and they're super expensive. I just, I didn't want to do that. So also I got an EF mount while I was at it. Wait, what? You got an E-mount? and an EF mount, so you got two different cameras or something. Here's the cool thing. Kinfinity offers all the mounts separately, easily interchangeable mounts. Where do you get that besides on maybe a red 
camera. Not even the Sony line of cameras that are $10,000 do that. The Canon ones don't do that. Kinfinity is giving you interchangeable mounts. I don't know why more cinema cameras don't do interchangeable mounts. Not only that, I got an EF mount that reduces the crop factor to 1.1 instead of 1.5 times. That's crazy. Like I have something that can use full frame lenses and pretty much keep the full frame even on a super 35 sensor. That's pretty good. I have the ability to upgrade EF lenses now if I want, but I get to keep using my E lenses. Not only that, if I want, I can go get a PL mount and I can rent PL lenses if I want to get into an even more upgradable space and get more cinematic and things like that. That's what's great about this is that this is giving me interchangeable mounts. Why are more cinema cameras not doing this? I don't know, but they should, they really should. There's a lot of options of mounts on the Kinfinity website. You get some that have electronic ND filters as well. The E-mount is passive, it's what I needed. It's not an electronic mount, that's fine. I don't know why, Sony doesn't put the stuff out there to allow people to use their mounts, but I use manual lenses anyway, and this is for cinema, so manual follow focus is where it's at for cinema anyway. So this is my eye focus with my hands. And I know, I know, I know what you're thinking right now. Doesn't RED do this? Yes, RED does this, but can you get it in an affordable price at this price range? I wanna talk about the Komodo for a, a, a really, really quick second. The Komodo had yet to be released when I bought this camera. It was rumored, it was coming out, it was on pre-order, people were noticing it, there were tests coming out, the Komodo was happening. Here's the thing about the Komodo. I know it uses an RF mount. I'm not getting an RF mount. And it has an EF mount adapter. Already that's not on my radar. Can't use it. I would have to get that and new lenses and it's already out of my price range. It's out of my budget. It's a $6,000 camera, uh, which is a really good cinema camera. It gets you red cinema space. It gives you raw, it gets you ProRes. Cool. Unfortunately, it doesn't even have ProRes 4.4 for four, how many times is it, do you say it three times? 12 bit color, it only does 10 bit, which is fine. It might come with a firmware upgrade as this happened with the Kinfinity and other cinema cameras before it. And I'm sure it's a great cinema camera. It's actually a really good, affordable, uh, entry level cinema camera for people who are wanting to get into that space. If you already have EF lenses or RF lenses, uh, then go for it. If you don't mind having a camera that needs to be upgraded with firmware later on, uh, then go ahead and get it. It's a camera you don't buy for now. It's a camera, as Mark has brownly put it. Don't buy a piece of tech based on the promise of future software updates. You should buy it based on the fact that you like what it is right now. It's a camera you buy for what it's going to be in two years, not for what it is now. And I agree with that. Unfortunately, I wanted a camera for what it is now. And so, whereas the Komodo is the only comparable thing, I think with these cameras, the Kinfinity was the camera that I went with. And for the price range, it's like a thousand dollar difference and I'm not having to use proprietary stuff and I can use third party things. I can actually get that budget way down with the Kinfinity. So I'd say the Kinfinity is already ahead of the game when you compare it to the Komodo. Now the interesting thing is that Kinfinity has been said to be the Chinese red before. Well, I'd actually put it closer to what Ari is doing with the Alexa and the Mini. And I don't know anything about color space. I'm not very good at seeing these things. I'm a little bit colorblind. But I'm, I've been told or I've read on forums that the REC log and uh, to 709 works really well with the kidney log that you get from this camera. The thing you should know is that this only shoots log. You can't burn in a LUT, that's great. You can attach LUTs to it to monitor their things, different things, and it'll even give you whatever LUT you're monitoring with on the file structure so that you can use it later in whatever NLE that you want. So I use the Ari one because I heard that was really good and I really like the color space that it comes out with. I think it looks great. And I'm gonna show you this image. Here's the Ari Rec 7 online LUT, and here's the stock Kenfinity 
uh, 709 LUT that it comes with. They are slightly different, um, but I don't mind the difference. And I think they're both really good. The thing is, is I have the option because it's log, it's shooting in log anyway, and I'm getting this high dynamic range. It doesn't matter. I haven't put this thing through its paces. So, hey, uh, I'll let you decide. And I think that that's what's great about this camera is that it's not following in Red's footsteps. It seems to be following in Ari's footsteps and it's giving it to us in a, a really affordable form factor I, I just, I can't, I can't get over it. So that's it. That's essentially why I bought the Mavo 6K. This camera that you're watching right now, I wanted to get away from the DSLR form factor. I wanted a cinema style upgrade. I wanted something that was within my price range and allows me to still upgrade from what I wanted, uh, allows me to still use the things that I invested in and more. This is a camera that can grow with me. This is something that I feel, unlike other cameras on the market, was made for video people and therefore I felt like it was made for me. Now I talked about this camera for multiple reasons. One, I wanted to tell you about my journey and about my belief when it comes to buying video cameras. Uh, two, I want to challenge people to uh, advocate for video cameras, for things that are made for video people first. I want us to stop relying on cameras that were made for photographers and start pushing companies to make things that are made for video people instead of us settling. I feel like we've been settling for years on like, okay, we talk about specs and we talk about codecs and we talk about like the 4K and the things and all the little, little incremental upgrades that these things can do over last year and over this camera and over what, and every one has their power. And I've given a lot of shit to DSLRs and all of those are really, really good. The more we start championing these kinds of cameras, the more companies are actually going to make what we want. The other reason I want to talk about this and bring you on this journey is because buying cameras is a personal experience. I have people ask me all the time, what camera should I get? And there's no really one size fits all answer. Yeah, you have to consider a bunch of different factors. What's your budget? What are you going to use it for? What are you coming from? What do you know about cameras and how are you going to, how's your workflow going to be? And these things aren't the same for everyone. And there's a whole lot of things that have to go into it. For me, the Mavo 6K checks all the boxes of the things that I wanted. Don't get me wrong, there's a lot of good cameras out there. There are people that I would suggest to get the Sony a7S III or the Canon R5 or something other than a cinema camera that cost $5,000. I'd do that. I would suggest those things first if it's the right camera for them. For my purposes, this is a camera that I was looking for and it felt like it was made for me. If you're interested in seeing more footage and actual things from this camera or us using it behind the scenes, subscribe. Keep watching this space uh, because now that I have this camera, I'm going to be able to use my not yet retired A7S II for more behind the scenes. I'm going to be able to get back into vlogging and I'm going to be able to do more stuff on here than I was able to do before because I now have a dedicated camera for uh, work stuff. If you're interested in the Kinfinity or what I bought, I put my kit in the description below. You can see everything that I bought uh, that got me to around $7,000. Uh, and there's some other alternatives as well of the things that they offer that I didn't get yet. I might upgrade to later. You might be more interested in them than I am, whatever. It's all there. Go check it out. Uh, I think this should be on your radar and I'm sorry it took however long this video is to tell you that I bought a new camera. Um, I hope this makes sense. I hope you enjoy this. I am looking forward to talking more about it. If you have any questions about the Kinfinity, anything like that, feel free to ask below. I'm going to be doing more tests. I'm also going to be testing out my Steadicam and other things. I got a few projects in the pipeline. I got a music video and a dance film and another YouTube video that I'm already filming this week and filmed some last week. So these things are going to be coming out. You're going to be seeing footage soon. Keep an eye on the space. Thank you for watching. I'm glad we could sit down and talk again and just hang out and chill. It's been a, it's been a weird year. Yeah. Glad you're here. Catch you later.